Hi, welcome to the bathtub. Uh, I'm Scott Bradfield. We're, we're reading books for um, selfish pleasure and not learning anything about them. And uh, this, this, this week I wanted to uh, touch base with a, one of the many little serial, uh, serial talks that we're running is based on a, a book I reviewed last month, which I really enjoyed, a, a, about Astounding Magazine. It was a science fiction magazine. It started off as astounding something and that turned into, now it's analog and, and science, it was turned into astounding science fiction and the names changed but the influential editor was a guy named John W. Campbell and we're looking at some of the writers who who were published and who uh, made that magazine very famous in its day and who continue to be very influential in science fiction. Today I want to talk about uh, somebody I don't even know how to start talking about a event vault. I've always wanted to spend more time Writing, I always really want to write something about him. I've definitely wanted to spend some time in the bathtub with him because he's. I, I've read several of his books in the bathtub over the years, and I can't even begin to tell you <laughs> what strange books these are. I don't think most most of you will not know who A. Van Vogt is. And again, I don't know if I'm even pronouncing his name right. He's a Canadian science fiction writer. He published a lot of books with John W. Campbell in the 30s and the 40s many of which were some of the most famous, the most influential science fiction novels of the period. And the closest I can think of, for those of you who don't know anything about A.E. Van Vogt, because you probably haven't read him, is he was a big influence on Philip K. Dick. And you can really see the, Philip, the influence when you read him. And I think he's a lot more interesting than Philip K. Dick, who I think can be very funny. Um, he, he has no sense of humor. He's an almost humorless writer who's kind of inadvertently funny sometimes. But he's very—he's a very serious writer, and he's completely mad. Uh, I, I can't—I I don't even know whether to say he's a good writer or a bad writer. He is that peculiar, and he was known for uh, writing. Uh, he had a certain method of writing, which, to my mind, makes him really—he's a surrealist narrative writer, if that makes sense. So he's surrealist. There's not a real logical continuity to the way his stories develop. And they completely go in totally ridiculous directions, sometimes page after page. And his method of composition was roughly um, to write, he would, he would go to sleep and he would set an alarm clock. There's an interview with him with Charles Platt from 30 years ago. He, he describes this. And he, he would go to sleep, he'd set the alarm clock, and after an hour or two, he'd wake up and then he would take his dreams, where the dreams would be fresh, and he was woken up in the middle of them, and he would use those dreams to compose the next section of his novel. So it was kind of a collaboration with himself, and the stories really sound, feel like that's how they're written. They're, they're just completely bizarre. One of my favorite things about, about the whole history of science fiction, it's one of the most interesting to me, is, is Astounding was really known when I was reading science fiction more in the 60s and 70s, as the hard SF, it was really scientific, and it was real science and fact-based. And I can't think of a magazine that was more nutty and metaphysically crazy than Astounding and some of the stuff that John W. Campbell came up with. They were really bizarre, strange, and definitely influenced by dreams more than physics. And there's no better writer to read for that than A.E. Than Van Vogt. So that's a number of ways to say that you're, whenever you read a Van Vogt book, now his, most of his books were, the, the best of his work is considered the stuff he wrote in the 30s and 40s. He, uh, he eventually went off and started working with Hubbard when Hubbard started Scientology. And he was, uh, he ran the office, I think, in Los Angeles for quite a while. And then he quit for various dis disagreements with Hubbard. And then he went off and he did auditing, so science, science, Scientology-like auditing of, of people. And then he came back to writing science fiction in the 60s and 70s. The late books, from what I understand and what little I've read of them, are not that easy to read, though I will try them again. Um, but what most of the books he wrote, he published in uh, Astounding. And there wasn't really a big paperback market at that time. So it wasn't until the 50s and the 60s that he started to put together these books as paperbacks. And, and they, sometimes he would take different stories, he would sew them together, he called them fix-ups. He came up with the term fix-ups. And um, he wrote a number of books. So it's sometimes hard to distinguish which are the interesting ones from which are not. 
I really think this is an interesting one. It's called The World of Null A. And I thought it would be a good way to start talking about Van Vogt. Um, there, there is a, a, there is a uh, slightly rationalistic premise for Null A. And that is something called general semantics in the 50s that was created by a guy named Alfred Count, Alfred Korzybski. Korzybski, I'm pronouncing it wrong. And I can't explain general semantics. Frankly, I don't think A. Van Vogt could, could explain general semantics, but it was very influ, inf, inf, influential on some of these writers, right? like Heinlein and Van Vogt, and it clearly had some, some influence on Hubbard and his development of Scientology, I would guess. The roughest idea of sem general semantics, and I'm totally imperfect here and completely wrong probably, is that there are no such things as identity, that we are, we are locked up in a kind of Aristotelian ideas that we understand identity. And I have an identity, and you have an identity, and this book has an identity. And that there is no, there's this constant flux, and you have to be continually questioning everything. And so this, this sort of notion of semantics and language as being a way of questioning the reality of existence and the reality of our lives and the reality of ourselves. In fact, we're supposed to be infinitely more interesting than we appear. Okay, if, uh, inherent in these ideas is notions of Superman. We are all filled with supermen, in the same way that uh, in some way some arguments for Dianetics is that it's supposed to release the superpowers in you, and that's what John W. Campbell talked about. So there's all this idea of a superhuman abilities, super uh, you know, psychic abilities, and 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 these these kind of register a lot in this book. Okay, so none of that matters, I don't think, when you read this, because he he mentions general semantics a lot, but it seems to have nothing to do with the book, and and. It starts off in a futuristic, far future world where supposedly general semantics has unlocked everybody's abilities. And there's a gigantic machine that's taken over the world, that's been built to control the world, and it's been built according to general semantics. So, so we're, we're supposed to be in some super future, super reality. Now, they have something called the games every every so often, in which all these people come to the town, or wherever the hell we are in this book, because it's never very clear. We come to this place, and they have like they go through all these t uh, tests and so forth to find out who's the most uh, null a non Aristotelian, the most open to the flux of the universe and then and the, the so forth. Now that's the premise. It never goes anywhere <laughs> because so many weird things happen in the course of the book. Every few again, every few pages, the plot just goes off in these weird, t weird uh, uh, slingshots. Is the phrase that John Clute likes. They're just, they're, there's not just a slingshot at the end. The slingshot's every few pages, and it is. And there's a narrative quality to the story. So it's not just you know Mallarmé type surrealism. It's narrative, and it keeps you going. And the crazy ideas keep shifting. And again, the no, the notion of general semantics has very little to do with anything in the book. Um, I want to. Another thing, again, the science, there's no science in this book at all. It's just stuff he's pulling out of his butt. Um, and it's still compelling. I can't put the stuff, I, his better books are just, you can't put them down. Let me give you a, um, here, let me give you a page, this is page 27. There's two of these, there's three of these books, by the way. This is the first one. And he comes to see the giant machine, which is, I guess, covering the whole planet, but I'm not entirely sure. The machine was at the far end of a broad avenue. Mountaintops had been leveled so that it could have space and gardens around it. It was a full half mile from the tree-sheltered gates. It reared up and up in a shining metal splendor. It was a cone pointing into the lower heavens and crowned by a star of atomic light, brighter than the noonday sun above. Now, if you really look at those sentences very carefully, it's completely confusing. But there's something about the way Van Vogt writes that really conjures up this really weird futuristic world. There's no specificity in it. He's constantly describing like you know, impressive cars driving up and uh, dangerous looking men. And there's no specificity. But somehow the, the narrative drive of the stories and the weirdness of the narrative shifts keep you reading. Um, my favorite part is, again, the... the this, this sort of science. There's a character in here named Gosain. 
He's supposed to be the most. I'm going to have a little bourbon here. I think a little bourbon is really good to read uh, Van Brook, by the way. Um, his name's is Sane, and the, the play, the pun is, is meant. And he's the central character who, who, within the first 30 or 40 pages, there's something mysterious about him. And, and the whole premise of the opening, which is he's going to go to this competition to see who's the best thinker to take over the planet, um, it, he just gets thrown out of it. Like within the first scene, he's thrown out of it, and he's wandering around. And whose identity is, it's very unclear. And people, he's not who he thinks he is. And all sorts of weird things start happening to him. So all, we, we never really make much progress in the main point. Now, the, uh, the, you start to get into all this weird psycho babble and science fiction babble. Um, trying to find one of these passages. Is it? Okay, so 118. They're trying to explain how this machine works, and the machine is describing itself to him, describing how it works. It says, An electronic system of brains is a very curious and limited structure. It works by a process of intermittent power flow. In this process, the denial of power at the proper split instance is as important as the flow during another split instance. The door sorter permits only movement of energy, not the hindrances or the variances. When it is focused on any part of me, the particular function to which it is attuned ceases to have inhibitions. In photoelectric cells, thyrotrons, amplifiers, in every part of my structure, the flow of energy becomes uniform and meaningless. My system of public communicators is constantly under this baneful influence. This is the machine that's talking. It's supposed to be the all-powerful machine, which understands everything. And yet it's constantly lying to everybody, I think, is what it's they're telling us later. But we don't really know because the plot changes it so radically. It turns out that, that uh, Ghost saying ha somewhere part of it, they find out he's got a third brain or an extra brain. He's, they call it an extra brain. And... Uh, and here's another passage near the end where we're supposed to be actually understanding things better. There's lots of expository dialogue in it. Some of the worst parts and the hardest parts get through some of the expository dialogue. But near the end, one of the various bad guys, there's a lot of bad guys running around, who's just referred to as the gang. Just G-A-N-G. -G. Just all the bad guys are part of the gang. <laughs> they're like interstellar, by the way. They're all over the galaxy. They're, they're coming from all over the galaxy. People traverse galaxies in this book like they're going across the street to get a loaf of bread. That, that's how scientific it is. And at this one point, the guy says to him, um, this extra brain of yours has its limitations. I guess all extra brains have limitations. After all, if it was able to oppose a major invasion by itself, then the third goes saying would have been brought out without preliminaries. The truth is, one man is always vulnerable, even with a limited immortality. Again, things like a limited immortality, you know, I don't get that. Um, how you, it's immortal, you're not immortal, but it's a limited immortality. So I'm, I'm, I sound like I'm making fun of him, which I don't mean to be. It's just that he's kind of a mix of a compelling writer who's awful, in many ways. And you'll go through passages that are just really awful. I find when I read a Vavo book, I get, and I think that's true of Philip K. Dick, you'll sometimes find. Philip K. Dick stuff can be all over the place. When you get near the end of these books, you really start, you, I, I actually stop trying to figure out what's going on because it's clear he's just going to, whatever you figure out, he's going to change it after his next nap, you know. And it, it kind of loses it. But there's some there, there's a certain coherency to this book that, that works better than some of the others. The Weapon Shops of Isher is one of his most famous ones, which I, I want to reread again for the bathtub. Um, so what I want to say last is, is that Van Vogt um, was was incredibly influential uh, science fiction writer in the 30s and 40s. It was, he, he was a, a powerful presence intellectually. Um, and... It's hard to understand why, in a way, because this stuff is so crazy. And yet, uh, it still holds up. Now, what happened to Van Vogt is in the 50s, uh, 50s and 60s, when he started to go, go off into the Scientology stuff and uh, kind of lost some of that uh, the energy. He, he lost something in his, in his energy of his work. Um, he, he sort of got, started getting criticized by people like Damon Knight, who was a fairly literary science fiction writer and editor, wrote a very famous essay 
talking about how bad Van Vogt is, because there is he is really bad <laughs> and really good at the same time. And you can only find out if you like it by, by reading 30, 40 pages and, and, and seeing how you go. So he wrote this essay, which kind of made a joke of Van Vogt. And it's really hard not to understand why he would write that. At the same time, it sort of eliminated some of this. He, Van Vogt kind of went off into a byway, and people didn't really take him seriously for a long time. But his stuff really, it really deserves to be read. And um, he's, uh, he's, he's quite entertaining um, if you're in the right mood for it. So again, a shot of bourbon will help. Okay, I, I do want to do some more Van Vogt. I hope I did some something towards explaining why I, I go back to Van Vogt and why um, I can understand why nobody wants to read him at the same time. I think they're both good approaches to A.E. Van Vogt. All right, we'll talk to you next week. Bye.